Good morning. Good morning. You ready to worship? Would you stand and sing with us this morning? How lovely is God's dwelling place. moment and greet someone next to you this morning. Welcome them here. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to church. It's good to see you today. Uh, glad to have the opportunity to worship together. 
We just want to highlight a couple of things as we start our time together. Um, first, if you have any questions this morning, please feel free to catch one of the ushers in the back, and they will answer any questions you have about the services this morning uh, or anything else that's going on. We want to highlight a couple things, though, and you can find all this information in your bulletin. Uh, the first is that we have coming up this Saturday, June 16th, Faith and Family Night at Skyland Stadium. If you ordered tickets for that, uh, you can see Pastor Brian at the Welcome Center in the back after the service. He will get the tickets that you ordered to you. Uh, make sure that you have those. And you can still go. If you have not signed up, I believe you can still get tickets uh, at the stadium. And uh, that's still a possibility. But catch Pastor Brian in the back later. Also coming up, uh, just a reminder that starting July 1st, we have our combined worship services at 930, followed by a coffee fellowship time right afterwards. Uh, so just to keep that in, in your minds. And then also um, coming up is June 6th, uh, sorry, June 19th through the 26th, we are hosting Family Pro Promise Homeless Ministry. Um, and we have spots available to sign up to help with that. If you'd like to help with that ministry, you can sign up at the Welcome Center as well. There's a sign-up sheet there. Uh, and then the other two have a little bit, they're a little more involved, so let me just uh, try to break these down for you. First is, if you've been hearing about these community projects uh, from June 25th to the 28th, you see a box in the bulletin there about that. Just to clarify a little bit about what we're doing with that, there's two partnerships involved. The first is we're excited that this is actually a week-long missions trip for our students. You are all, as a church family, encouraged to be a part of that, uh, but specifically our students, 10 of our students are going to be using this as a time uh, to invest in our community, uh, to spend time in our community, but also as a team building, uh, building together a little bit. So we're excited about the opportunity that the kids have, but you can still be involved and sign up maybe to help with some yard work or help with some of the projects that we're doing. Um, you can sign up at the Welcome Center for that, or maybe you would like to be somebody who comes in and helps prepare a meal for the, for the teams that are involved in that one evening. The other partnership that's neat is with Milford Bible Church. We're partnering with Milford Bible Church to, to run these projects. Uh, we have some projects, we have a number of projects, at least 12 already I know of, um, some up in Milford, some down here in our area. So it's very exciting that we have the chance to, to work alongside of them. And uh, so we're, we're encouraged about that and looking for the chance to spend some time with their youth group and our youth group together, with our church and their church partnering together to do some projects uh, in the name of Jesus. So keep that in mind. And then also the other big announcement, just a reminder about Vacation Bible School. Um, there is still a sign up at the Welcome Center if you'd like to help. We still need teachers uh, and buddies uh, er, and helpers for the classrooms. So there's a sign up out there for that at the Welcome Center. There's also registration forms. If there's any kids that you know of that haven't been registered yet, please, the more we register in advance, the more of a help it is. So if you can, let us know by registering your kids. And also we want to make sure that you're aware that we have um, our special needs ministry here at LFC is, is providing a ministry for kids uh, with disabilities who, who would like to be a part of EBS. Uh, we're going to have a buddy program set up for them, but we have to have a pre-registration for that so that we can prepare and partner them up with someone. So if you know of someone uh, that, that that might apply to, uh, please catch one of the forms out of the Welcome Center. Again, we can show you right where that is and uh, get, get those students registered as well and make sure we'll make sure we have a buddy ready to go for them. Uh, and we're looking forward to VBS. Lots of exciting things happening with the, with the preparations for that. Uh, and if you would prayerfully consider that maybe you could find a way to be involved in that ministry as well, we would love to have you be a part of that. I said a lot, I'll be done. So if you would stand with me, we'll continue our time of worship together, uh, and we'll read, uh, we'll say Psalm 96, 1 and 2 together. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Psalm 96, verse 1 and 2. Jesus, we are so grateful that you have uh, opened our eyes this morning. You've put breath in our lungs and you've given us the chance to praise you, to sing of your goodness, of your mercy, of your power and your authority. And God, we pray with all of creation that we would declare um, your praises. We pray that this morning we would be faithful to declare your praises. And God, we pray that we would be faithful as we leave this this place, that we would be worshipers of you in what we say, in what we do, and in how we live. 
Father, we love you. We give you this time, and we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to introduce a new song to you this morning. It's so glorious by Bethany Brown and Paul DeRoche. Um, I hope you find it very worshipful. So just kind of let yourself go and let it join us. And let it just be a moment for you to commune with God. Look inside the mystery, see the empty cross, see the risen Savior, victorious and strong. No one else above him, none is strong to save. Fills the 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, merciful, mighty, there's none beside you. We can never say enough to describe you and the love that you have for us. A love that goes beyond understanding. 
I love that we want to come here to praise, to lift our voices up to, to open up your word so we can better understand it, be better equipped to go out and share the message of your love with others. Oh, how we thank you for this opportunity to gather as a family, to bow our heads now before you together, to humbly come before you. Oh, Lord, we thank you for hearing us, for never leaving us. And Lord, we do come to you sometimes with hearts that are heavy. And Lord, we do lift up to you the Brooke and Zimmerman family on the passing of Dina Brooke this last week, Lord. Oh, what a dear sister, Lord, but what a joy it was to meet with her and see the love she had for you that gives us such hope as we know she's with you and we know she's been healed of any sickness and hurts. And for us as believers, it's until we are all together again. But it's still hard for families, Lord, to let a loved one go. So, Lord, help us as a family to love on them this week. And as next Saturday we celebrate her life, Lord, may it bring you all the honor and glory in that service that you so deserved. Lord, we lift up to you just our community, Lord, just so many things going on. So many people that are struggling and hurting for different reasons, Lord, and you know each and every one of them. Lord, help them to seek you for answers. Help them to seek you for a peace that goes beyond understanding, to seek you in all things. We thank you for those that served yesterday at Lafayette Day as her tent was there to be a light in the midst of our community, Lord. Thank you for the great conversations and literature that was passed out. And Lord, we ask you to do mighty things with those seeds that were sown. And Lord, we excited about the chance for us to come together as the body. When we partner with Milford Bible Church, Lord, in this coming week as the youth come together to unite, to go out into their communities here and in Pennsylvania to, to serve their communities, but at the same time, more importantly, to shine for you in those communities, Lord. Help them to be bold. Help the the adults as well that are joining this, Lord, to be bold in their witness to those that they come in contact with. Keep them healthy. Keep them safe. Lord, let it be a great time of bonding together. Lord, what a joy it is to know it's not just this church, but the church is your body around the world. Lord, we lift up to you, Milford Bible Church, as they meet right now, Lord. Be Pastor Tim up there, Lord, just, uh, Lord, let your words flow through him. Let them be a sanctuary full of people hungry for you, excited to be together in your name. Bless that church, Lord. Lord, we ask you to be with Pastor Aaron as he comes forth in a few moments to share the message you put on his heart. Lord, help us to put all those distractions of the busyness of this time of year away, that we would see you and hear you through the message that you give to us. Through him, Lord. Lord, we are so grateful for the fact that we get to partner with those that take the message to the other most parts of the world. And Lord, this week we lift up to you one of our missionaries, Leroy and Kay Lindsay. What a great blessing they are, Lord, to us here. What a joy it is to have them with us in this congregation on a weekly basis, basically. Lord, we thank you for their foremost for their love for you, their desire to, to, to share that good news with others, their desire to teach others more about you. Lord, thank you for keeping them safe on this last trip. And now as uh, we'll hear shortly, Lord, about the many trips coming up that you would continue to use both of them in mighty ways. Lord, we thank you for their testimony when it comes to their marriage as they celebrated 53 years of marriage just recently, Lord. Continue to watch over and bless them, Lord. We love them and we thank you for allowing them to be a part of our body right here, Lord. And Lord, now we give back to you just a small portion through our tithes and offering. 
Lord, may we use it for the furtherance of your kingdom, to bring you all the honor and glory you so deserve. We love you. We praise you. And it's in that precious and wonderful and powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. is here shout the news to everyone it's a new day peace has come jesus saves mercy triumphs at the cross love has come to rescue us jesus saves hope is here what a joyful noise we'll make as we join in heaven's song to let all the world know that Jesus saves. Raise a shout to let all the world know that Jesus saves. Free at last, every debt has been repaid. Broken hearts can be remade. Jesus saves. Sing above the storms of life. Sing it through the darkest night. Jesus saves. Free at last. What a joyful noise we'll make. As we join in heaven's song To let all the world know that Jesus saves Raise a shout To let all the world know that Jesus saves Sing it out To let all the world know that Jesus saves Raise a shout To let all the world know Jesus saves you save you see restore reveal the father's heart to us you rose to raise us from the grave your spirit lives in us sing it out to let all the world know that Jesus saves Raise a shout to let all the world know that Jesus saves. Shout it out to let all the world know that Jesus saves. Raise a shout to let all the world know that Jesus saves. Sing it out to let all the world know that Jesus saves. Saves. Raise a shout to let all the world know that Jesus saves. Sing it out, we shout till the whole world knows his name. Sing it out, we shout, for we will know your name. Jesus saves. What a joy it is to be able to tell that Jesus saves wherever the Lord sends us. We are so happy for our relationship with LFC, uh, the years that we've been here, the friendships that we've formed, and we just want to say a little bit of thank you uh, with uh, a little time this morning. Thank you to the pastoral staff for allowing this. And uh, I just want to share something before the slides start. And uh, yes, 53 years with this wonderful woman. I'm, I'm so thankful.
I don't always get to have her go with me when, when I travel, but uh, I thank the Lord for those times. And, you know, we, most of our ministry has been in discipleship because we are teachers. But once in a while, the Lord just gives us a, a surprise. And in the midst of teaching Romans, Romans chapter 6, uh, many of you that have studied Romans know what I mean. When it, Romans chapter 6 is a, is a very deep subject about uh, the relationship we have uh, with the Lord and, and sin and, and what we should do about sin and so on. And, and suddenly a man just, just blurted out in the middle of class. He said, I want to die to sin. And, and uh, it was, I just had, I asked him a couple of questions and suddenly realized he didn't know Jesus as his Savior. He was in a seminary class studying theology and did not know, was not sure that Jesus was his Savior. And right there, we interrupted the class and we got on our knees and he received the Lord Jesus as his Savior. He was, he was boohooing. He was, he was tearful. He was, he was emotional. He said, God has saved me. And the very next day, the very next day, he got to witness to a person in his job. Because he, he, is a, he is a bureaucrat in, the, in, a, in a local government in Mexico, and everything is done by money, money under the table, right? That's, what, that's how you do everything. And somebody walks in and says, uh, how much is it going to be? And he says, nothing. And she says, what? Yeah, what that wasn't what it wasn't was yesterday. And he says, God has changed me. She said, you mean from the night to the morning, you're different? She said, I want to know that kind of God. Let's, um, let's roll the, the slides and, and uh, give you our thank you. Yes, we are Kay and Leroy Lindsay working with One Mission Society. Uh, after 26 years in Mexico, uh, working with families, working with couples, getting to know the people and their culture, God has moved us out. And uh, we work with the seminary. Uh, as, uh, as the president, as the dean, as teachers, working with the young people in training them to be pastors and teachers, seeing them graduate and get prepared for what God has for their life. And now we're international. Leadership training in action is what we're about because in every class we need to lift up the fact that God changes lives. We used to go to Venezuela, but now we have to go uh, via um, only recordings. So right here in, uh, at, right here in, in the church, uh, I, I did the recordings. In Haiti, uh, I, don't pre I don't speak Creole, but uh, there was the translation. Working with the staff of the Emmaus Bible Seminary, being able to go to countries like Cuba and, uh, and relate with those young people, energetic about knowing the Lord and about serving him and even getting to share in some of their culture, a 54 Chevy, right? <laughs> um, Peru, oh my goodness, every time we go to Peru, we are amazed at what God is doing in that country and in an area of uh, ethnic, uh, an ethnic group uh, where we go in the mountains there, they, their, their lives are changed. In Bolivia, a, uh, at a university, a Christian university, the young people are so enthusiastic. In Spain, just last, uh, last October we were in Spain, and what a joy to, to witness what God is doing in a totally secularized country where even 12-year-olds can do whatever they want and their, pa and their parents cannot tell them no. Listen to me. They need the gospel. And we're so glad to be able to work with church planters. We, we counsel people. We, we work with them uh, on their problems. And, and we see what God is doing changing lives in a country like Spain today. And wow. Speaking to gypsies, and I get translated today, and I was being translated that day, recently in Northern Ireland and England. We don't often get to, to see much of the country, but we were able to this time, even though I preached 10 times in 12 days. Recently in Northern Ireland, there, uh, that, that lady just worked, worked and, and got us into the, into the military uh, establishment there. And what a joy to see uh, soldiers coming and hearing the word of God and seeing the response of the people. We're going on to South Korea, Philippines, and uh, to uh, the South Pacific. Uh, the 23rd, we leave this, uh, this month, and we'll be gone for seven weeks. God is going to work through us. We'll answer the call. Come back to teach us. There's no one here to teach us the Bible like you have, Brother Leroy. I don't explain it. 
but they say, when can you come back? When can you come back? We hear that call over. So thank you for partnering with us, investing in eternity. That's what we're about. We could not continue to serve without your prayer support. You are our family. Thank you. Well, let's pray, and I want to have an opportunity to pray that the Lord would use His Word this morning, but also that the Lord would continue to use and bless Leroy and Kay. Father, we are grateful for this day. We are thankful for the power of the gospel. Lord Jesus, we are thankful that You desire that none should perish, but that all should come to a saving knowledge of You. And we thank You so much for Leroy and Kay and their faithfulness in sharing the gospel, their willingness to go. And we pray that you would particularly bless them, use them, protect them, guide them as they leave on the 23rd. We thank you for their, uh, again, willingness to go and to share. We thank you for their faithfulness. And we ask that you would bless them in every way on this next journey that they're taking. Lord, we pray for the fruit of many, many seeds that have been planted, many seeds that have been watered through their ministry through the last trip and we ask that you would continue to bear fruit and grow those students and, Lord, folks that they had an opportunity to share the gospel with maybe for the first time. Lord, we ask that you would bring a harvest in their lives and in their hearts as well. Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray this morning, as your word is proclaimed, that you would be honored. Lord, we pray that you would give every single one of us in this room ears to hear. Uh, Lord, give us boldness to respond, obedience to respond, Lord, as you would see fit in our hearts and lives. We love you and we thank you, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And as you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. How many of you remember the first time you ever planted something and it grew? Do any of you remember that? I remember when I was in kindergarten in Mrs. Lund's kindergarten class. I remember uh, her handing out styrofoam cups. I remember filling it up with soil. I remember poking my finger in, putting some seeds in there, covering it back up. And then every day we would water it. We'd set it in the windowsill in the classroom. And I can remember the excitement of waiting for the first little sprouts to come up. And watching it over weeks until finally we had a styrofoam cup full of flowers. And if I recall, we took them home right before Mother's Day, I think, to give to our moms. I remember being fascinated with that. Just last summer, Kelsey planted some cucumber seeds. And we don't do a lot of planting. We really don't have a space or really the time for gardening. But she decided she wanted to plant some cucumbers last year. And it was so fun. We just kind of put them in there. We didn't do much with them, watered them. And it was so neat to see uh, those sprouts come up and all of a sudden those blooms turn into little tiny cucumbers, into full-size cucumbers. It's amazing. It just is amazing to watch that grow. I can remember watching on TV, and it was an interview with a farmer years ago, talking about the process of planting and harvesting. And I can remember the interviewer saying, you must kind of get just bored of this. It must really not mean much to you. The planting and the harvesting and this process just must become second nature. And I can remember the farmer saying, oh, it doesn't matter how long I've done this. I'm always fascinated, and it's such a blessing to see those first sprouts come out of the ground. When we think of seeds turning into something bigger, when we plant a seed and it turns into flowers or into cucumbers or into a crop of corn, we can't help but to be amazed that something so tiny, something that seems so insignificant could become something so beneficial. Jesus this morning, as we look at the last two kingdom parables, compares the kingdom of God to two seeds. In these parables, he's going to talk about a seed that grows. And then in the second parable, he's going to talk about how the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. 
And part of what we're going to be learning about the kingdom of God today is that though it may start small, it grows large. And though it may seem insignificant at times, it blossoms into something powerful, that it is God at work when we see people coming to know Christ. It's God at work when we see the kingdom expanding all around us. We've been looking the last couple of weeks about what Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God. And we always need to be reminded what the kingdom of God is when we read about it in the Bible. We've said this often, that the kingdom of God, number one, is the rule and reign of Christ in the hearts and lives of boys and girls and men and women. The kingdom of God is here and active because Christ dwells in us. We also know the kingdom of God is yet to be fulfilled or consummated, that when Jesus comes back a second time, the kingdom of God will be fully consummated. We know, number two, that the kingdom of God is that which Jesus was passionate about. He taught about it. It was one of the main subjects of his teaching. When Jesus came to earth, he declared that the kingdom of God had arrived because Jesus ushers in and is the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so the kingdom of God is that which Jesus treasured and had, was passionate about and taught about. Number three, we've learned that the kingdom of God is not the church. That the end goal of the church is not to build up this local body of believers, but our goal is to be a tool that God uses to expand the kingdom. And that's why we do kingdom partnerships with churches like Milford Bible Church. That's why we want to be a part of God expanding the kingdom, not just our local little church. And then finally, we know that the kingdom of God is that which we are called to spread through the Great Commission. We've learned through these kingdom parables, for instance, the first week that Jesus is the sower of the seed. Yet we, through the Great Commission, have been handed the baton. We are now the sowers of the seed. That we are called to expand the kingdom through the Great Commission. And so we've kind of focused in the last couple of weeks in Mark chapter 4 as we've learned even more specifically what the kingdom of God is like. In the parable of the sower, we learn that the kingdom of God is that which we've been called to plant, but for which He is responsible for harvesting. That just as Jesus was the sower of the gospel seed, we've taken that baton and it is our job to faithfully sow. But it's God's job to harvest. We learned last week with the parable of the light in the house that the kingdom of God is that which, which must be shared as light, but which must be received. And we've been called to shine our light. This week, as we look at the parable of the growing seed, and then we look at the parable of the mustard seed, we find two new truths out about what the kingdom of God is like. That the kingdom of God is that, number one, we'll see, which is supernaturally grown. And then secondly, we're going to see that the kingdom of God is that which may have started small, but has grown and will continue to grow. So let's look at these two parables and let's be reminded of what the kingdom of God is and how we apply it to our lives. Let's look at the first parable this morning, starting in verse 26, Mark chapter 4, verse 26. Jesus continues teaching about the kingdom of God. He also said, verse 26, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, and then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. So first of all, we see Jesus telling his listeners, teaching us that the kingdom of God is that which is supernaturally grown. And every listener would have understood that. Basically, he goes back to the imagery of the first parable, the parable of the sower, and he says the kingdom of God is like a farmer who throws the seed out. And remember, we learned that in ancient times, they would throw the seed out on the ground and then plow it under. And so he has this picture of the farmer sowing the seed, and I love what he says, no matter what the man does, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. This is a picture of the supernatural element of the growth of the kingdom of God. 
Now, let's not forget what it is that the seeds represent. The seeds represent the Word of God, the gospel. And so what do we learn from this? Well, number one, we learn that the Word of God is powerful. The Word of God is powerful. Jesus is teaching something about the power of the gospel. It's an amazing thing, isn't it, to take a seed and the life and the the beauty and the power that is in that tiny little seed. It's amazing. I was reading articles this week preparing for the message about how people can find and botanists and scientists have found seeds from even ancient times. And though they've been dormant and sitting and being unused for hundreds of years, they can be planted and plants grow. I read an article about some scientists who found some seeds in a a rattle necklace, a, a little necklace from about 600 years ago. People had put seeds in a pod. It was worn as a necklace. They opened it up and they took those little seeds out and planted them. And amazingly, they grew. And in 1968, one tree actually grew to a six foot tall plant. It it flowered and it bore some type of fruit. Amazing. A 600 year old seed. I read another article that in 2008, a botanist planted a 2000 year old seed. They'd found it in some ancient fortress in Israel. They planted it and it bloomed into a date tree. Isn't that amazing? 2,000 years old. And then I read another article about a group of scientists in Russia in 2012 who found some seeds that had been encapsulated in ice for what they determined was somewhere around 10 or tens of thousands of years and they planted it, and I want to show you a picture. This is what was grown from a seed that had been encapsulated in ice for who knows how long, thousands of years at least. Isn't that amazing? So there's no wonder that Jesus uses the imagery of the power of a little seed representing the Word of God. It may seem small, it might seem insignificant, but in that seed is life. We need to be reminded, and this ought to encourage us about our trust in the power of the Word of God. That's why when we share with our friends and family members, we don't just share tips for life. We don't share a message about how to make life better here and now. We share the gospel. Because the power of the Word of God, the message of eternity, the message of hope in Christ contains the power of life and it contains the power of death. Why would we ever substitute the Bible for gimmicks? Why would we ever, as a church, use a methodology that reaches people with something other than the gospel when it is the gospel that has the power that God uses, that the Holy Spirit uses to transform lives? The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Martin Luther, the great reformer, understood the power of the word of God. A matter of fact, once he broke the chains of Roman Catholicism, he said that his great goal was to do two things. Number one was to bring the people a Bible that they could understand and read. And number two, to bring the people a hymnal that they could understand and sing from. And this is what he said about that. He said, let those two things loose and like fire they will spread on their own. We see in here a reminder that the the Word of God is powerfully used by God. Secondly, we see this truth in this parable, that the Word of God also works in miraculous ways. I love this part of the parable. Do you notice what is it that the farmer does in this parable? In this parable, the farmer doesn't even water, the farmer doesn't cultivate, the farmer doesn't even pull any weeds. What does, the, what does it say? It says that he scatters the seed, and then night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, it says, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. What does the farmer do? 
The farmer plants it, and then he takes the sickle to it. Mysteriously and powerfully, in a miraculous way, God brings the fruit. We need to be reminded that the Word of God works in miraculous ways. Can I tell you? I've been blessed always to serve congregations where there's been a a really big uh, Roman Catholic population in the area. And it's the most amazing thing when people will come to the church out of like Roman Catholicism or out of cults that don't focus on the Word of God. And and like Roman Catholicism very, very often doesn't equip or encourage people to read the Word of God. The messages usually don't focus on the Word of God. I can't tell you how many times it's coming out of those backgrounds after they've sat under biblical preaching for a while will come up to me and say, I can't believe it. You are the greatest preacher ever. I've heard that a lot. Now, it's not true. I will tell you that. What they are amazed at, though, is maybe for the first time in their life, they've sat under someone like there are many faithful preachers elsewhere who preach the word of God. They're not transformed by me. In this digital age, it doesn't take them very long to find out who the really great preachers are out there, R.C. Sproul and Chuck Swindoll and some of the real great preachers. But what they are blown away by is the mysterious and miraculous working of the Word of God in their life. It's amazing when people have not been exposed to the Word of God, when it's just simply taught and proclaimed as it is how the Lord supernaturally uses it to transform their lives. It's an amazing thing to see. As believers, we must never deny, never be embarrassed or ashamed of or stop proclaiming the supernatural element of the Christian faith. Christianity is a matter of faith, believing in a higher power, God himself, who transforms us miraculously and inwardly. And he does that through, as well as other means, the preaching, the study, the memorizing, the learning, the trusting in, and the sharing of the word of God. Let's never deny that and let's Let's hold on to that and celebrate that, that the Word of God works in miraculous ways. And then we also see another truth about this parable, that the Word of God, number three, usually works over time. We see in this picture, this parable that Jesus is preaching, that when we plant the seeds of the gospel, when we share our faith, when we proclaim the gospel, when we share it with our friends and our family members, our co-workers, that most often it is a process of God working and growing that in their lives. And let that be an encouragement. Let's be faithful. And that's why the first parable we learned said, let's be faithful to sow the seed. Let God do the work. Our business is faithful proclamation. God's business is bringing that seed to fruit in his time and in his way. Someone once asked Hudson Taylor, the great pioneering uh, missionary to inland China, said, what are the characteristics that make a great missionary? And Hudson Taylor said, the three most important characteristics of a missionary are patience, patience, and patience. And I would say that as missionaries where God has planted us right here, that we proclaim the gospel. And I would encourage some of you, remain patient that person you're praying for, that you invite to church, that you share the gospel with, that you pray for, that you give tracts to, be patient. Don't give up hope. Continue to be faithful. So how can this encourage us? How does this parable encourage us? Well, first of all, it encourages us that no matter how fruitless our efforts may seem, we never know the life-giving work behind the scenes by God. Think about that. Isn't that just the perfect picture that Jesus paints. You put that seed in the ground like I did in kindergarten. You put your finger in, you put the seed in, you plant it, you cover it, and you don't know what's going on. But all kinds of things are happening under the surface. Think about those seeds, some of them thousands of years old that lay dormant until just the right time when they were planted 
And all of a sudden the water is applied and something miraculous happens. So don't be discouraged. And I think this is also a great reminder to us that we must be sure that we always get beyond peripheral issues in our witness, that the the seed that we spread is always the gospel seed, that we don't spend time with a lost and hurting world necessarily talking about and arguing about secondary issues. The world needs to hear the gospel. And all Bible-believing churches stand firm on that gospel. That's why we cooperate with other churches. Not because we have the exact same beliefs in all the secondary matters of doctrine and practice. We don't. But what we do focus on and have in common is the message of the gospel. That Jesus is the only way to salvation. That salvation comes only by grace through faith. That it is not of works. That one must receive Christ personally as Lord and Savior. That one must repent and accept Jesus as as the free gift. Much beyond that, matters become secondary. Many of them are very important. But we plant seeds. We plant seeds cooperatively. We're kingdom focused because we believe that is the message that transforms people's lives. So we should be sure to make sure the seed we are planting is the gospel seed. And then this encouragement that I think keeps coming up time and time again in these parables, and it's an encouragement with this, that after sowing our seed, we can relax knowing that it's God who does the conversion of people's souls. I don't mean relax as in we never have to water a little bit, we don't have to continue to be faithful, but don't miss the point in this parable. I mean, this farmer didn't even water. He didn't weed. I mean, it is God doing the work. And the point that it's making is be faithful. God will be faithful. Plant the seed. Let God do the work. So in this first parable, we see this truth that the kingdom of God is that which is supernaturally grown. And then we move in the second parable from talking about planting in general to planting a specific seed, the parable of the mustard seed. Now, before we read this parable, don't forget the context. So Jesus is proclaiming to a a relatively large group of people that are following him. We've learned, though, that many are rejecting him. Many are around him just kind of for the show or what they can get out of Jesus. The group of people who are actually committed and following Jesus is a pretty small group. It's a ragtag group of 12 men, probably a a good group of women who are also following around, some people that will never know their name, but it's a small ragtag group of believers. And remember, many of the Jewish people were looking for a political savior or a political messiah. Even the disciples likely had this vision of a kingdom here on earth. I mean, they're wanting to see this little thing of following Jesus grow into something big, something political, something that would make an impact on the political scene. So as Jesus continues to preach and preach in a way that people are even rejecting him, they must have thought, wow, is this ever going to amount to anything? So Jesus tells the parable about what the kingdom of God is like, and he says it's like a mustard seed. And as I read this parable, I want you to take a look at this picture of a mustard seed. Mustard seed is dinky. Many of you, you've seen a mustard seed, probably most of us, but a mustard seed is about that size. And the, the size of a mustard seed was used in the ancient world. It was a common saying uh, in Jewish circles. People would say in secular circles, if they wanted to talk about something being tiny in size or tiny in stature or importance, they would say, oh, it just was as small as a mustard seed. It was a very common saying. And so Jesus is going to use the mustard seed to show us a little bit what the kingdom of God is like. And he's going to remind us that the kingdom of God may have started small, but it grows and it grows and it grows. Listen to this parable. Verse 30. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? 
Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. So Jesus here is saying the kingdom of God may have started out small, but it has grown and it continues to grow in stature and importance. Now, the, the background here is one that makes us kind of scratch our heads because we get the idea that the kingdom of God starts maybe small and grows into a huge mustard bush or a mustard tree. And mustard trees could get, especially if left alone in the wild, could get as tall as maybe six to eight feet tall and maybe 12 feet in diameter. So it was certainly a bush or a tree big enough for, for uh, birds to nest in. But when we read the bird detail, it makes us scratch our heads because we get the fact that the kingdom of God will grow, that it may have started small, but it's going to have a huge impact. That's the point. But where have we seen the birds before in Jesus's parables? Remember the parable of the sower? All you have to do is look back a little bit earlier in chapter four. And remember what he said, that there were some seeds that are sown on the path. And then what does it say? It says that, uh, as soon as they hear it, verse 15, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. And you remember what the picture of Satan and his minions were? Birds. And so it makes us ask, why did Jesus include the, the picture of birds, the mention of birds that roost in the mustard tree or the mustard shrub? And I think it's to give us not only encouragement about the kingdom of God, hey, it is growing, it will grow, but I think the birds are there to give us a warning about the nature of the kingdom of God. That as it grows, inevitably, not only will, will there be blessings, but there will be challenges. That there will be, as the kingdom of God grows, those who will try to co-opt its message. There will be messengers, there will be representatives of Satan roosting in the kingdom of God. And what would a bird do in a big mustard bush? Well, the bird would pluck out and try to take the seed, try to take the blooms, and would try to devastate the tree. And he's painting a very real picture and a warning. And that's why we must be diligent about making sure we proclaim the true gospel because there will always be those under the guise of the church, under the guise of Christianity, under the guise of the kingdom of God, proclaiming false gospels. A matter of fact, historically, we see this happening almost immediately in the life of the church. As soon as Christianity became the official religion of Rome, the beginning of the Roman, Holy Roman Empire, the Roman Catholic Church was born, and we see almost immediately the birds coming in to the, to the, the shade of the kingdom, of the true church. We see throughout history the rise of the Roman Catholic Church, which has proclaimed and still proclaims a, a doctrine of a works salvation. Even in modern times, under the guise of even evangelical Christianity, we see the birds that perch, the birds of the word of faith movement that proclaim to be Christian but are anything but gospel-focused. A, a group of people that say Christianity is all about what we can gain from God rather than what we can give to God. That God blesses financially and materially and, and physically above all other blessings. That is, that is the measure of God's blessing. The Word of Faith movement uh, teaches a, a false gospel of what we can get from God rather than what we can give to Him. One of the biggest modern proponents in the Word of Faith movement, I don't even want to mention his name, you can Google him, 
is such a charlatan that did you catch last week that he appealed to his followers, people often who are hurting and poor and in need, to send him money so that he could buy a $54 million jet? Did you see that? Because his other two jets weren't sufficient? Our, our Christian culture is filled with charlatans and birds that prey on weak and hurting and needy people. We see also kind of as the birds in, in the shelter of the kingdom of God, things like uh, leaders of the cults. Mormonism is another perfect example. Mormonism tries so hard and has for the last 30 years to market themselves as, as a, another expression of Christianity. That the Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ. And in reality, Mormonism is nothing but rehashed religion by works, a cult of, of works. We even see in maybe what we would call even the more mainstream kind of a looking picture of Christianity that those that call themselves evangelicals are, are, uh, are compromising the gospel by, uh, by reaching out to people with all kinds of unbiblical means. The point is this, that the Word of God works in miraculous ways. It's powerful, but we must plant it faithfully because there are those who rise up and there are those who would, would proclaim something that looks like Christianity but is anything but it. So it's a, an encouragement to us as believers to make sure that we faithfully proclaim the gospel. So how do we apply this? How do we wrap this all up? All four of these, these parables of the kingdom. Well, I think we are called to really take a look at our calling is those who've been handed the torch and are now proclaimers of the gospel. And I think we can take from these parables three or four just vital truths of encouragement. Number one, for those of us who have been called to share, which is every single one of us, understand this, that it is normal to not always see immediate results from evangelism. Many people give up witnessing and sharing their faith because they don't see what they call results. And can I tell you the reality is that God seems to have gifted and used some people in really incredible ways that they share the gospel and someone will come and pray and receive Christ right then. And thank goodness for men and women like that, that God uses. But the reality is most of us are sowers. Most of us are waterers. We've been called to faithfully proclaim. We don't often get to see people coming to Christ. Understand that that's normal. And a matter of fact, understand these parables even teach that that is reality. So it's normal not to see immediate results, but don't take that for God not using you and God not at work. Secondly, I would see this. I would say this in these parables, that number two, it's normal for a Christian to grow. Remember, we talk, we've talk. we been talking a lot about the kingdom of God kind of in the broader sense of how he uses our church to expand the kingdom. But remember, the kingdom of God is in the hearts and the minds of believers. And so just as the kingdom of God is growing externally, the kingdom of God should, in a sense, be growing in us. And we need to be reminded that as believers, we should be growing in our relationship with Christ. To say it another way, if you're not growing, then something is wrong. Now, we need to be reminded that we are going to have a lifetime battle with sin. That our sanctification is something that takes place over our entire life. But part of the truth of sanctification is that God is at work. He's transforming us. He's enabling us to overcome sin. He's enabling us to become more and more like Christ. It's a process. It's a lifelong journey. It's not a constant parabola of growth. But it is the reality in us that, that Christians grow. And I would encourage some of you, and this is kind of off the subject, but some of you who desperately want to become more like Christ are desperately trying to overcome sin, desperately seeking to overcome doubt or struggles, <coughs> I would encourage you 
to keep on keeping on. And we may feel like we live in a microwave culture, but spiritual growth takes time. It's a process. It's relationship. It's a daily surrender. And then another daily surrender. For some of you, it may be an hour by hour surrender, but God is at work. Continue to grow. Continue to strive. And know that it's normal for you to grow and, and become more and more like Christ. And then finally, I would just say this as we close. This has been a constant encouragement in these four parables, and it's this. That we are called to plant the seed. We're called to help people grow. But ultimately, it is God who brings the growth. So let's be faithful. Let's plant the gospel seeds. Let's make sure that we are communicating what we've been called to communicate. And then let's trust and believe that Jesus does the work. I love that song that was sung for the offertory. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Jesus saves. If we believe that, we should be passionate and faithful and joyful about planting the seed because Jesus does indeed save. Let's close this morning, and I want to get, just pray for you as a congregation. And uh, what I want to invite you to do is for you to bow your heads for a moment. And as we close, we've been doing this several weeks. I'd like for you to think of someone in your life that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I would encourage you right now to take a few moments. And would you pray for that person? You might be getting ready to see them for lunch. Maybe you're going to see them tomorrow morning at work or at school. Whatever it is, would, would you think of someone in your life that needs to know Jesus as Lord and Savior? And would you pray for them? And would you pray for yourself that you'd be bold and faithful and that the Holy Spirit would, would give them ears to hear? So pray for them right now. Would you do that? And after praying for them, I, I want to encourage you to pray for three more people. Number one, would you pray for yourself? Would you ask the Lord to give you boldness and faithfulness and obedience enough to share this afternoon, tomorrow, this week with that person? And then would you pray for two other people, maybe the people sitting right next to you? Would you pray for each other as the body of Christ, as brothers and sisters? Would you pray for those around you that they would be faithful as well? So pray for yourself and pray for a couple folks around you this morning. Finally, as we close, let me pray for Pray for you, pray for me, pray for us as we leave this place as sowers of the seed, bearers of the light of the gospel. Heavenly Father, as we close our time together this morning, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the power behind it. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for how you use it in powerful ways to transform people's lives and eternities. And we pray and we ask, Lord, I ask this for myself. I ask this for every one of my brothers and sisters here that we, that I, would leave this place and that uh, we would faithfully bear the light, faithfully sow the gospel into people's lives this week. Lord, help us to do that with boldness. Help us to do that with joy and assurance, knowing, Lord Jesus, that you do save. You save people's lives. Help us to believe that and help us to live our lives in that truth and with that assurance. Lord, I pray for every single individual that has been on somebody's mind this morning that needs you. Lord, you know their lives, their hearts, their needs better than any of us here. But for every single individual, Lord, that is on someone's heart and mind right now, we pray for them and we ask in Jesus' name that you would save them, that you would open their hearts and minds to truth and to your love and their need for you. And I pray for every one of us that we would boldly share this week, Lord. Please, please help us. 
Father, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for your word. Lord, may we live it out this week uh, faithfully and boldly. And we ask all of these things this morning as we leave in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed this morning.